Good morning. Welcome to the first joint assembly of the school year. It's nice to see all of you here. You know we are in for a real blessing this school year. I'm excited about it. And I just pray that um, we will all stay healthy and learn all that the Lord has in store for us. I have just a few announcements. Um, the Academy students will be meeting here for church and <clears throat> church services this week. I need you to bring a pen or a pencil and also bring along a pair of walking shoes. We're gonna do something a little different for part of our service, worship service, and you can leave your shoes out in the hallway, out on the other side of the entranceway, okay? So they're not all congregating right here. Uh, some of you know, <clears throat> and some of you worked with David Machado, and um, you may have heard that his father-in-law, Abby's dad, died of COVID yesterday, I believe it was. So if you will keep the family in prayer, it's a, as you can imagine, it's a very difficult time for them. Um, and I need to meet with the junior and seniors from the academy for just a brief moment right after assembly today, if you'll come up to this area, okay? Let's kneel as we pray. Father, this morning, we are so grateful to be your children, to realize at least a little bit of how interested you are in us, the things that concern us, the burdens we bear, our joys, our trials, our sins. You know them all, and you're anxious to help us with each. Father, I just thank you for that. You're such a personable God. We're so blessed to be able to know you, not as a distant king or ruler, but as our friend. We thank you for the signs all about us that Jesus is coming soon, and I just pray that the work of transformation that you're wanting to do in our hearts will be complete, that we'll cooperate at every step, and that we might end this year looking back not only with no regrets, but with grateful hearts for what you've done and helping our experience with you to grow sweeter and richer. We ask for your blessing on this assembly and on our school day. I ask you, Lord, that you will send your comforting spirit to be with the Dragomers and with the Machados. You know the pain that is in their hearts right now. I'm thankful they will not have to wait long to be reunited with their loved one. But until then, Lord, comfort them. Encourage them, I pray. And I thank you for all of these gifts, for we've prayed in Jesus' name. Amen. I uh, also want to um, just mention to the uh, Academy students that we are still testing for ACT, SAT, and um, PSAT. And in, even though we are living in a different world, um, we are still administering those tests. So the deadline for signing up for them is in the next week or two. I can't remember exactly when it is, but it's sometime in early September because the test is in October and it's like a month and a half before when the deadline is and you pay extra fee if you do it after the deadline and you have to sign up online if you want to take them. The, SAT, the ACT we require all seniors to take and juniors can take it if they wish, although we might, they might wish to take it in February, we also offer it. So um, 
you need to be thinking about you sign up online and pay online. It's not through um, us, but it's through the organization. Um, the, the PSAT, everybody, I will sign you up for. That's the juniors. <clears throat> uh, good morning again. We are thankful for another year uh, for the opportunity of being able to worship together and to work together and to study together. Uh, it's such a joy to have students on our campus again uh, since April. We almost haven't had many anyway. <laughs> and it is a blessing to, um, to begin a new, a new school year. Um, in our family worship at our house, we have been reading through the story of the redemption. And not long ago, we were going through creation, and then we were going through Adam and Eve, and we came to the chapter on Cain and Abel. And again, was re-enforced um, in my mind the incredible story that as soon as there was sin in this world, there was a, an instantaneous result that we have had ever since then, it was, it was mentioned in the, in the chapter there that there are, there are two classes in the world, and they began at the Garden of Eden as soon as sin began. There's the Cain class and the Abel class, and one is righteousness by works and one is righteousness by faith, and these are the contrasting views, and, and since the beginning of sin until the end of time, we are facing that. And at the end of time, there is going to be this revival of the, of the righteousness by faith, the, the loud cry that is going to go to the world. And yet at the same time, there is going to be a, a false system called Babylon that is righteousness by works and that is arising and is in, in gaining momentum and is overcoming the entire world because all the world is going to wander after the beast. And so those two systems come along. But then there was Cain, and because of his righteous brother, he got angry at him. You remember the story. He got angry at his brother who was trying to do what? He was trying to serve the Lord. He was living a righteous life, and he was trying to convince and reason with his brother about how he should serve the Lord. Now, the new bit of information to me is that it said in there, at least maybe I've forgotten it, but um, it said in there that Cain brought what the Lord required. <laughs> and I thought, wait a second, nobody, the Lord required a lamb and he brought the fruits. Did God also require the first fruits? He did. And so he brought what the Lord required, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> Because it was, it was required, God did ask for the first fruits, but the first thing that God asked for was righteousness by faith in Christ. And without that, the first fruits would mean, be meaningless. And so he was partially obeying, but he was not completely obeying. And he wasn't really, he, the main issue was he wasn't surrendering. In fact, it said in there that Cain was angry at God for the curse that came upon man because of his sin. <laughs> so he was justifying his action against God because he was angry at him for God's action. It was unjust, it was unfair, God just shouldn't have cursed this world, and we are living in this, yes, we made a mistake, but why all this curse? And he was rationalizing it away until he came to the point where he justified himself and then, of course, his brother's trying to convince him, listen, God, God is merciful, and he, he expects this. And his brother gets angry. And anger and, is associated with what in the Bible? Anger and murder go together in the Bible. And so then he, in his anger, and if you can imagine if you were Cain, I don't know, I've sometimes wondered if you're Cain, and he somehow picked up a stick or picked up a rock or something, and got so angry, he threw it at him, and it hit him just right, and he's dead. And I don't know if Cain goes, <laughs> I mean, maybe he didn't, I mean, when people are angry, are they thinking rationally? I mean, their minds are not, right? They're not thinking rationally. They do irrational things that are, and they do danger. I mean, they, lots of stories. They kill people, and, and then afterwards, they regret it because, you know, they're not thinking at the moment. It, the anger shuts down the frontal lobe, and you're living on the... Uh, the amygdala, and it is, that's it. There's very little activity in the frontal lobe when those things happen and the, and the emotions are taking over. And so I don't know if he was shocked, but at any rate, he, he tries to justify himself, and then finally God comes to him. You remember the story in Genesis there, and God comes to him and says, Cain, Cain, where's your brother? And what happens? 
What does Cain say? I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? Now, who is Cain talking to? <laughs> who could think that they could lie to God? But the very first lie recorded in the Bible is Cain talking to God. Now, granted, you might say there's others because uh, Lucifer lied in heaven, right? <laughs> as far as human, con human relationship is concerned, uh, he, he lies to the face of God because he's trying to justify his self-righteousness. And God turns around and basically says, listen, you are responsible. You do know and that we are a web of humanity in which we are interconnected and our influences, our actions, our decisions influence others. And we are accountable for those influences, for those actions and how they influence others and how we treat one another. From the very beginning of sin, we are responsible. We are together in this sin and we have to together lift each other out of this sin by leading them to Jesus. And that's part of who we are. And God, from the very beginning, we have this coming on down to our day today. And where Cain and Abel teach us a lesson is that indeed, God is looking down and with some effort and with some earnestness, he is saying, listen, we are each other's guardians to a large extent that our, what we do should help one another and we are responsible. Now, you and I are living in a different world than we were a few years, a few months ago even, almost a few days. I mean, just like rap rapidity. And it's a different world. And if you were Abby today, you are living in a vastly different world than two days ago. Mrs. Clark said, Abby is a graduate from Washington Hills. Well, she didn't actually graduate from the academy, but she sort of, I mean, she came to the academy and then she went to the college and David graduated from the college, David and Abby. Um, uh, Abby Dragomir was her name. Now she's David Machado's wife, so she's Abby Machado. <laughs> and her parents had one daughter, um, Mer Mercha and Valentina Dragomir. Uh, we know them well. We know them well. Dear friends of this institution, Abby came through school here. My wife was her dean. Um, and it is with grieving hearts <laughs> that we look and say, they are, they've lost. Abby texted us and said, I never thought I'd lose my dad before he turned 70. He's in his 60s. I never thought. I can't imagine life. <laughs> now, it is a different world that she is living in than yesterday. And almost every time we wake up, it's a different world than it was just a day or two ago. But certainly, as we look around the world today, we are living in moments that many people look at and say, you know, I don't know if this is the end of time, but it sure easily looks like it is. <laughs> you know, if it looks like a zebra and it acts like a zebra and it, uh, and it um, lives in Africa and it uh, runs from lions, do you think it might be a zebra? <laughs> You know, it looks like the end of time. It sure acts like the end of time. It, it, we're living at the end of time. <laughs> and maybe this is the end of time. Okay, it, we've been in places like this before, and it might not be. Other, as other huge disasters have happened. It wasn't the end of time. Or granted, that, that very well could happen. But, but it sure could happen. And people are recognizing. But notice this quotation, because at the end of time, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is going to happen. Yes or no? It's called the what? It's called the latter rain. And we all know it's coming. And if the end of time is here, if the end of time is here, what is almost here? The second coming is here. <laughs> but the Holy Spirit being poured out in the latter rain is almost here, right? Because that's going to happen before the second coming, right? So if this is the end of time, the Holy Spirit is about ready to become, right? It has to. At least it's going to happen at some point. Now, when that does and all that stuff, you know, it could be a while, but it, it could be pouring out. In fact, we are told that it could be pouring out all around you and we wouldn't know it. As some people wouldn't know it. And it could be being poured out now and we may be missing it. It could be happening. But listen to this quotation. It says, the great outpouring of the Spirit of God, which lightens the whole earth with His glory, this is the latter rain speaking to, will not come until we have an enlightened people that know by experience what it means to be laborers together with God. 
So, two things. Enlightened people and those that know by experience that they are laborers together with God. They are actually working in conjunction with him for what he is doing on planet earth. Then it says, when we have entire wholehearted consecration to the service of God, God will recognize this fact by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit without measure. So what is necessary for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit? Entire wholehearted consecration, that there's no hold the bar, we are fully sold out and we are giving ourselves to the consecration of God and to his service. That has to happen before he's going to pour out his Holy Spirit. Then it says, but this will not be. What will not be? The Holy Spirit will not be. While the largest portion of the church are not labors together with God. God cannot pour out his spirit when selfishness and self-indulgence are so manifested. When people are thinking more about themselves and what they can get and all the things that are, are consumed in their lives instead of what God's mission is and helping with others. And then it says, when a spirit prevails, that, if put into words, would express the answer of Cain. Am I my brother's keeper? In other words... God will not, cannot, and I guess, I mean, he could, but he will not pour out his spirit while in his people there is this attitude, am I really my brother's keeper? I'm just out for me. I'm concerned about me. That's all I'm worried about. And we are living uh, our lives focused on self, not what God's mission, burden is uh, of ministry to others, of self-sacrifice for others, and of caring for one another. And it goes beyond that. And so, so how can we be our brother's and sister's keeper? How can we keep our brothers and sisters? Because brothers, you know, I mean, it includes sisters, doesn't it? We're not just keeping our brothers. I know many times we have to keep our brothers. This side of the congregation, I mean, it needs extra work sometimes. <laughs> we all need extra work, don't we? <laughs> but we need to be one another. How can we do it? Here's a couple ideas. You know, Academically, in a school like this, many people struggling with grades academically. How can we be our brother's keeper to help one another, to lift them up, where we have a burden to support one another? And not just say, ah, he got an F, that doesn't concern me. She got a bad, you know, she's really struggling in algebra. I, or that, um, uh, what is it, uh, the, um, uh, the class, a uh, Greek, Greek class in there. Boy, boy, that's a... I can't get, I just can't understand. I can't remember that. How can we help one another? Where we take an interest in people that are struggling and then say, yes, we need to support one another. We need to help and let's come alongside and we can encourage. Can we do that this year so that we can be our brother keeper when it comes to our sister's keeper, when it comes to how they might be struggling acad academically? What about when people are, you know, when we start a new year, there's all sorts of adjustments and people are away from home and they're homesick. What can we do to help one another and be our brothers and sister's keepers? Be a friend. Say an encouraging word. Come alongside them. Support and encourage and help them because people are. And, and, and I hope it doesn't happen. We, are not, we, we shouldn't have bullying. But, you know, when we come on picking on people or putting practical jokes or laughing at people, those are all forms that are similar to bullying. And it shouldn't happen. What is a bullying saying? A person who bullies. I don't like you. I don't care about you. I need to put you down. I'm number one. I'm the chief and you're lower than me, and I'm going to bully, I'm going to push you down. That's what bullying is. And it, all these things sometimes have that same thing where we are not a brother's keeper. In fact, we are indulging in the very thing that is going to shut the Holy Spirit from being poured out. Does that make sense? And maybe the spiritual life, when somebody, you know, is, I, my prayers just seem, we can come along and we can help them and encourage them and, and pray with them. And these things, I mean, there's probably lots of other ways that we can understand and say, how can we be our brother's keeper so that we are encouraging one another? Now, um, I wanted to go back because I think in particular this idea, this concept of being our brother's keeper has important implications in our lives in the world in which we, you and I are living in. At the dragon, when the dragon mirrors, uh, that's uh, Mir Mir Mircha is the one who died. Um, they worked at a self-supporting institution similar to, to us, sister institution. I lived in the city right nearby it. We often went out to it when I was growing up. My wife went and was treated there. It was a medical institution. As far as treatment is concerned, they have everything when it comes to natural remedies. And Mircha himself and his wife were 
medical missionaries. They ran for some time their own medical little um, health center, <laughs> he and his wife. People would come, six at a time, and they would come, kind of like with the one we have here. But they did treatments and all this stuff and diets and all this stuff and had remarkable results. They knew everything when it comes to our health law, and they were practicing it. So they're working there, and they're living there, and at that institution, a patient came to be treated. I don't know that it was for COVID. In fact, she was, she was tested for COVID, and it came back negative. Doesn't have it. But she was being treated at the institution because they have these sessions there, and this is some time ago, some, some uh, weeks and, uh, ago, when it, months ago, a month or so ago when it, when it began, and was being treated. But unbeknownst to her and to the institution, she did have COVID and she was contagious. She ended up transmitting it without knowledge to the s- students who were caring for her. That weekend, the students are done with their responsibilities. What are we going to do? Let's go camping. So a, large, a fairly large group of students decide, and they all go out camping together, enjoying the weekend. Unbeknownst to them, they are, there are students in that group that are contagious. By the end of the weekend, all of them had COVID, but they didn't know it. They came back to the institution. They interacted with the Dragomirs, both of whom caught it. And by this time, they suddenly kind of realized, hey, we got COVID. Some people are starting to test positive. By that time, it was too late. Mr. and Mrs. Dragomir both had it. Now, the students, by and large, had very mild cases. They just had a headache. They had a little bit of uh, maybe a fever, but most of them a couple, four hours of a headache, and that was about it. One of the students, however, though, had a worse. She was in her 20s, and she had a worse experience. And at one point, her blood oxygen level was measured at 40%. And if you know anything about that, you're nearly dead at 40% if it doesn't change. And probably it did. Otherwise, she wouldn't have made it. But she was struggling even for her own life in her 20s. And by the way, the age at which COVID-19 is affecting people is dropping. And that might be because we're just testing more people and all that sort of thing. But, but we're realizing that it is affecting younger people. And we had a student that was in her 30s, a former student from here, who actually is, was fighting for her life in ICU um, in her 30s, a graduate from uh, the academy. And um, so it is affecting people as it is dropping as we realize that. And so this, the, now Mr. and Mrs. Dragomir have it. They're at an institution. They do everything that they know to do. And they know a lot. Hydrotherapy, healthful. They're already living those things. But they know them and they have the resources and they do what they can. Now for Mrs. Dragomir, she had a hard go of it. Sometimes she was struggling and barely breathing, able to breathe. And it it looked bad for both of them. But uh, she ended up recovering, and things got worse for him. Finally, was they decided to go to the hospital. And, but at that point, he was really struggling. And he was in the hospital in ICU. Now, Abby, the daughter, and David, they wanted to go see their dad. But now, by the time they got there, he was in ICU. He, she never saw her dad before he died. Imagine the trauma. Not knowing, and then suddenly he has it, and then going to help, and you can't do anything but get a phone call from the doctor. These are realities of people that we know that are living in institutions like this that could happen on this campus easily in a similar way. It's just the reality of the world that we are living in, and it happened. This is a case study that happened that is very close to home. And the agony the heartache that we share with them because when a member of the body of Christ suffers, we suffer too and we agony and our hearts have been heavy and weighed down for our dear family that are suffering now because of COVID-19 and the impact that it has had on their family. And we don't want that impact here, do we? 
We don't want that impact here. And, and so, you know, th- with, with COVID-19, there's no su- silver bullet. Coronavirus, it's not w- one thing. And, you know, there are, we live in a world that is incredibly divided. Uh, and there are conscientious, dedicated, intelligent, smart, and every other adjective you could have, people on both sides of the controversy over coronavirus and masks and social distancing and countries and politics. I mean, on every side that are conscientious, godly, dedicated people. And this world is being split apart. Is it true? <laughs> I, um, I have this thing that my sister sent me. And um, it was a kind of a parody on all the things that uh, since the beginning of coronavirus, I'm going to just read a couple of them, that basically describe this uncertainty and all this conflict in the two sides. And it says like this, masks are, ne- are unnecessary, are useless, but, 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 but maybe you have to wear one. It can save you. It is useless, though, but it, it may be mandatory as well. <laughs> Stores are closed, except, of course, when they're open. The virus is deadly, but still too scary, but not too scary, except that sometimes it actually leads to a global disaster. The virus has no effect on children except for those it affects. You have some, you may, you may have, listen to this one, you may have some symptoms, I mean, you may have many symptoms when you are sick, but you can get sick without symptoms, have symptoms without being sick, or be contagious without having symptoms. Oh my. If you are sick, you can't go out, but you can go to the pharmacy. If you get restaurant food delivered to your house, which may have been prepared by people who don't wear masks or gloves, but you have to have your groceries decontaminated and sit outside for three hours. Pizza, anybody? Um, You can't see the older grandmother, but you could take a taxi and meet the older taxi driver. The virus remains active on different surfaces for two hours. No, four hours. No, 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 six. No, no, no. Did we say hours? Maybe it's days. Uh, But it takes a damp environment. Oh, no, oh, no, uh, not necessarily. The virus stays in the air. Well, oh, yes, maybe, especially in closed rooms. In one hour, a sick person can affect 10. So if it falls, the virus, all children already infected at school uh, are, are already infected or at school before it closed. But remember, if you stay at the recommended social distance, however, in certain circumstances, you should maintain a greater distance, such as which studies show that the virus can travel further, maybe. (laughs) And it goes on quite humorous in a ways. And since this has begun, we have lived in this world of dichotomies where you hear one thing and you hear another thing, and you're like, what do you do? And for most of us, I think, I think we feel like maybe we're caught in the middle. And what do we do? How do we respond in this world of uncertainty? And, and the biggest thing that all of this tells me is that there's a whole lot about the virus we don't know. I mean, there's more that we don't know than we do, and everybody is getting on one side or the other, it seems like. And you know, it's a politically charged culture that we are living in. And it's quite interesting because um, Pew Research, uh, did, uh, where is it? The picture's not there. Um, Pew Research is a huge company that does uh, polling of people, well-respected company, and they did a big um, study asking about people's opinions about different things. Democrats and Republicans, Democrat and Democratic-leaning independents are twice as likely as Republicans and Republican-leaning leaners to say that masks should be worn. That is 63 to 29. If you're a Democrat, 63 to 11% yes, you should wear it. If you're a Republican, only 29 says yes, you should wear it on, on a whole. In other words, on almost every issue, and it wasn't just masks, it was on social distancing and all sorts of other things, there is this wide divide over coronavirus when it comes to politics. And we live, it as a, we live in, a, in a, a politically charged world that is rarely seen. Republicans are much more likely than Democrats to say that masks should rarely or never be worn, 23 versus four. Republicans at 23% say, yeah, you should never wear them. Only 4% of Democrats. So this world is divided and our country is divided or in many ways, even our church at times are divided. I heard of a church in, in, in Tennessee who they couldn't make up the decision about you know, whether or not to have masks or not have masks. And so they decided to um, have two services, the early services for the mask wearers and the later services for the non-mask wearers. <laughs> 
one in the church building and one in the gymnasium because they didn't want to share the same space. <laughs> Both conscientious, dedicated, consecrated people, I'm sure. Strongly opinionated, <laughs> as we tend to be. And um, so we live in this environment. It's like, what do we do? How do we respond? What do we, what do we, what is a Christian, what do we do to try to come together in some ways that's going to fulfill that obligation at the beginning so that God can pour out his spirit? And as I think about it in my own life, at least that we should have concern for one another, yes, and how we should relate because we are our brother's keepers. Now, how can we be your brother's keeper when it comes to coronavirus? Do you think, do you think if you could go back at, Uchi, at, the, at the place where the, the, the Dragomirs were working, and nobody knew, it's nobody's fault. They didn't, at the time, nobody was trying to pass this on, right? We're, nobody's at fault, we're not condemning anybody. But if they could go back in time, do you think they might have done things differently? You know, hindsight is twenty twenty. but if you could go back, I can imagine that they would have. And if we can learn any lessons, we might look at it and say, you know, what could we do that might have prevented that? And if you go to, if you go to the institution today, today, you'll find almost universal mask wearing, as I understand it, because they recognize this is a potentially dangerous that nobody wanted. And because we don't know if when we are contagious, you can be asymptomatic or you can be pre-symptomatic and not know it for several days, and you're contagion others, which is what happened there and highly contagious because everybody in those groups practically got it. And, and so if they could have gone back, they would have likely done different. But if you were the person that gave it to him, unbeknownst, right? You didn't know, you're innocent. There's no, nothing wrong there. But I still, if I were the person, and I could have done something that might not have done that to have the bad outcome that we didn't know was gonna happen, I would feel bad if I didn't do it, to try to prevent that. It might not have, but I would feel bad if I, if I wasn't doing all that I could to try to protect and keep my brother. We wished he wasn't passed away, but you can't go back. And so what can we do? We, we, we living in this world, but what can we do? And as we've gone over some of these things, and it's hard to get in some of these habits. And I, I hope maybe we're not going to hash this over. We've done this a few times at the beginning here because we have issues here on our campus. I, I was talking with the staff last night, and they, they told me, um, yep, if we had it on our campus, we would be ripe probably for a pretty mass spreading because there's things we are doing even sitting here as I look out at you that are not according to the guidelines that we've been given that might help mitigate it. Now, I, I put the might on there because it's still debated and a lot of people on different sides, but at least we could consider it. Um, first thing, it should be washing our hands in 20 seconds. I have a new habit in my house um, when I wash my hands. I hate wasting time. And I might encourage you to do this. I don't know. I hate wasting time. So if I have to spend 20 seconds doing something, I'm going to find two ways of occupying that time so that I not only spend the 20 seconds washing my hands, but I spend the 20 seconds getting something beneficial out of it. So you know what I do? If you soap up your hands with a little bit of water and some soap, your hands won't drip because they have soap on them and soap lessens the surface tension and so the water sticks to your hands and it doesn't drip on the floor very much. At least that's what I've observed. So I get a little bit of soap and I wash my hands and then I go like this. Well, I'm, I, I count to 20. I go one, two, three, four, five, six. I'm getting 20 seconds in. I'm getting exercise and it's not dripping. And by the time I get to 10, I've done 20 seconds and then I can wash off my hands and I turn off the water while I'm doing that. You don't need to waste water. And I just got some exercise. <laughs> I didn't waste my 20 seconds just sitting there going like this. In fact, I actually enjoyed it because I felt like I was benefiting myself. <laughs> That's what I've been trying. I, I tried that at the pal's house and said, you look like a frog. <laughs> I can imagine my long legs going like this, you know. Woo, woo. <laughs> if it entertains somebody and gives them a laugh, more power to them, right? <laughs> That's a good thing. So That's all right. I'll, I'll be a frog, a clean hand frog, okay? So... <laughs> um, that's one thing that we can do, and that can help because you're washing away those viruses that are there. But we have to get in the habit. Uh, a, while, a few years ago, a survey was done in the bathrooms, and somebody was just in there and watching to see how many people left without watching that, washing their hands. It was almost 80%. Students are in a hurry. 
you got to get to class. You don't want to take those 10 seconds, even five seconds, even two seconds in some cases. You know, I mean, that's the real world, unless we change our mentality. But listen, if we could view these as being like contaminated, like, Ugh! Ugh! if you had this view, this, this opinion that they are, they're bad, <laughs> then we would have this, okay, I don't want to touch anything. I don't want to touch anyone because I don't want to give this to somebody. And that handshake can give it to them. And if we do our part to keep our brothers healthy, that can be one of the things that we can do. Scrub club, it should be. Now, the other things that we're trying to do here is social distancing. And this is a particular problem in the cafeteria because when you go to the calf, there's these lines on the floor. And even though you can see them, I haven't been in there myself, but I understand that they're not very well followed. Is that true? What's that? Yeah, you get to the lines and you're waiting, but you're all waiting in a group back here so that you can get to a line. <laughs> so what good does the line do, all right? So what do you do? Unfortunately, right now where the weather's not too bad, outside there is lots of evidence that shows that when you're outside, the increased airflow, the sunshine, the air, is much less likely to transmit on outdoor environments than it is on an enclosed space. And so stand outside and wait and, and still social distance, we should anyway, and let's try to follow those. You know, we're at least these first two weeks. Because why? If we had an outbreak, would it affect you? It would be. Now, if it was only one or two people because we were doing practices, it might be able to contain it and curb it and, and stop it. But if it was suddenly 10 people that had it or something of that nature, everything on our campus is going to change. And your livelihood, your school, everything is, is potentially at, at risk. And so we should do our part to keep us healthy. But I think for me, it's like, you know, I might have it and I don't know it. And I, if I give it to somebody, I would feel bad if I could have stopped it. So these are things that we could do. Not touching, not hugging, or, or the handshake. And it's so easy to hug. Uh, we talked about the hand washing. What about the hand sanitizer at all the doors? When you, when you come in in the building, if you can use that to clean your hands before you go in and you touch anything. And then for me, when I'm going home, I use it before I go out. I try to because I'm, I'm, I'm in here and who knows what I've touched that might have been touched by other people and you can use it when you go out. Um, and those are ways that we can help to mitigate and to guard one another from passing on that thing. But, you know, the most controversial probably in our world today is this whole idea of masks. It's uncomfortable, it's inconvenient, it's annoying, we can't stand it, none of us like it, and we have this feeling, I don't have COVID, why do I have to wear it? I've been isolated and I don't have it. And so it's, if we don't like it, then we end up doing things that prevent it. Now, you know, it's controversial, and some people say it should never be worn. Countries that wear them, there are countries that have that basically have stopped the coronavirus in them. Taiwan and Thailand hasn't had a case of coronavirus in, in a couple of months, as I understand it. And they had it for a while, but they have universal mask wearing with other procedures and so forth. And there, are, there, is, there is a growing, as I understand it, there is a growing body of research that supports the benefit of mask wearing to trans, limit the transmission of it, but I don't have time to play. I had a little clip that from the University of California, a professor there of a, a pediatric infectious disease expert who actually was explaining that, the, that there is now a growing body of evidence that shows that, and initially they said, he said this, I wish we could do a restart on the masks because initially we thought it didn't do anything really, it wouldn't stop at anything. And so there was no recommendation. In fact, the recommendation was not to wear them. But he said, now we have a growing body of research that shows it is beneficial. And so if we shifted from that to, okay, it doesn't protect you, but it protects others. And that was the message for a while. But now he says, we have another growing body of evidence that says it actually can protect you as much as up to 65%. And there were a few incidences to show this. There was an outbreak, you remember, I don't know if you remember this, there was an outbreak on the cruise ship, the Princess in which they had like 400 people that got it. And of those that got it, 80% of them had like, if I remember the statistics, 80% of them had like um, serious complications. 
No, no, no. They were 80% of them had, they got it. And 20% of them had like asymptomatic. Okay, 20% of them got the active case of it where they had a fever and all that stuff. And, the, and there was 20% that were act, only that were asymptomatic. There, yes, I'm pretty sure that's what it is. There was another cruise ship that was later in March. Another cruise ship that was later in March and went, where they knew more about this. And as soon as there was an active case of it on, on board, they gave out masks to everybody on board the ship. And so everybody was wearing masks, or the majority of them were. And of that one, only... 20% had, like, were, uh, there was 80% that were asymptomatic. In other words, the cases that they got were minor or, or less severe than those that got it without the masks. That the masks showed some benefit because it changed this dramatic change in who was asymptomatic, what percentage of, the, of the, those that got it was asymptomatic. And so the thought was that 65%, it can limit your exposure and reduce the likelihood that you may have a bad outcome or a severe case, and you might only get a mild case if you're wearing a mask. At least that's the current research as I understand it. So there is this some, it's annoying, it's inconvenient, but there is some benefit to us, but there is huge benefit because you don't know, and you might be passing it on to others. And we are our brother's keepers. Now, how do we do that? Um, I, 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 um, I saw this quotation on the internet that says, wearing masks may seem a no-brainer. That's kind of, to me, it's like, hey, this is a respiratory thing, and it comes out of your mouth, and you spread it to others through this means. If you have something in front of you, it's like a no-brainer. But they are only truly effective if they are used with brains. <laughs> Does that make sense? And so how do you use them with the brains? It's a picture of a sneeze. Here's another one. Here's a picture of a cough. <laughs> Bigger droplets, still coming out with some degree of force. And notice this real quickly. Um, estimates, this one here is rather interesting. The highest estimates on how fast you sneeze out is that it comes out at 650 miles per hour or 950 feet a second when you sneeze. That's the highest estimate. The lowest estimates are much lower than that, but the average is about 100 miles per hour or close to 200 feet of a, a second. That's the length of this building, almost. Yeah, that's about it. 200 feet, one second. It's about how fast when you sneeze, on average, they estimate. Now, it doesn't go that far because, you know, it, it quickly dis slows down, but it can travel far. Um, how far can you, a sneeze can go six, or, six meters or 20 feet, a cough can go two meters or six and a half feet, uh, droplets, and breathing is one meter or three feet on uh, what we are constantly expelling from us. And so something in front of us, the research as I understand it, in front of our mouth to try to slow down that is effective to help control it. How do you wear a mask with a brain? Okay. As I look around, there are a number of people sitting here that are wearing it improperly. And I see it all the time, all day long. And this is why I'm covering it, because we need to wear them properly if they're going to be effective. And we want to try to eliminate the need. Now, it's uncomfortable. It's, none of us like it. Make sure the mask covers your nose, mouth, and chin. If you adjust the mask to cover these areas, wash your hands before and after. It says we should try to limit if you have viruses on there. We are limited to some degree what we can, but if we can, it would be good to wash them. But it should cover the nose, the mouth, and the chin. And there's a number of masks out here that are not covering them. It's very common on campus to have it around. The, it's easier to breathe that way, but you might as well not even wear one because you're not breathing through your mouth, are you? Your mouth is closed. You're breathing through your nose. It's open. So the only open device that you're breathing through is uncovered. It's not doing you any good. It's not doing others any good. <laughs> Okay, so it should cover the nose as well as the mouth and chin at all times. Um, don't wear them under your chin. <laughs> Have you seen this on campus? <laughs> I got my mask on. I'm following the letter of the law. <laughs> okay, it is ineffective. What about that one under your nose? It's ineffective. It needs to be of our both. Here's another one. I have people that walk into my office, and you can't talk well through these things. And so they're standing in my office. They were wearing them before they came in, but as soon as they came in, I've had at least three or four people do this, come into my office, and they pull down their mask to talk to me. <laughs> it's easier to talk. You can't talk without it. You're muffled, right? So it's hard to hear, but they pull it down to talk. And I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? How do we tactfully 
try to remind people and encourage people to do what we're asking them to do. We don't know necessarily if these things are going to (laughs) help. But when you look at sister institutions and so forth that have had that, you feel like, man, we got to do something. (laughs) Don't we? We got to do something to try to prevent this. At least we can say we did what we could. But if we didn't do it and we had it, we'd feel bad. And so let's do what we can. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe the, I often think, okay, so what if I'm in the middle? And what if, what if the one side that says this isn't a bad thing, it's all overblown, it's, it's a government cover up basically, and they're t- 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 taking power, and masks are ridiculous, and they're unhealthy, et cetera. What if that side is wrong? What's the danger of following their advice? Huge outbreak, lots of people dead, et cetera, et cetera, right? If they're wrong. What if the other side that says, you know, this is serious, and we should wear a mask, and maybe they're wrong? What's the, what's the outcome? We all wear masks, and we're uncomfortable and inconvenient. Maybe some, unhealth, unhealth, some people say it's unhealthy. Well, maybe there's some unhealth practices to it. I don't know. But if you look at countries that wear them universally, and there are countries that wear them universally, they don't have huge health crises because of wearing masks as far as we can tell. Um, And so there's lots of evidence that shows that wearing them is not a problem. And so what is the major outcome if this is wrong? Well, we had some inconveniences now granted, I mean, maybe the economy and that sort of thing, but as far as how we respond and how we transmit it to others, I'm not talking about the rest of the system, (laughs) but as far as how we are, our responsibility to try to help and curb the epidemic as it comes to others. And so to me, I look at it and say, what do we do? And so that is maybe in part why, and by the way, the, the governor of Arkansas has said, listen, schools and, uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a universe, it's a mandate now that you have to wear a mask in, indoors, in buildings, when you can't physically, uh, where, where you can't physically social distance all the time comfortably. And we have chosen as a school to say, listen, we want to wear them inside to do what we can, right? And it's uncomf- uncomfortable and convenient. But we want to, so how can you tell me, how can we encourage one another tactfully, remind them, listen, <laughs> doesn't work down here. I, I told a student just this last week, they were wearing it under the chin, and I was like, you know, <laughs> I tried to smile and look at her and say, you know, it really doesn't do too much good on your chin. I was smiling and kind of laughing, and I got this, <sighs> that's what I got. <laughs> what did that say? Oh, this is disgusting. I hate this thing. <laughs> and we all do, right? But as, but, but as long as we have that attitude, we're going to have difficulty wearing it until we come to the point where we say, okay, I think this is for the best and I ought to do it. Now, the other thing is make sure you can breathe and talk. And it's comfortable. Wear, get a mask that's comfortable. Now, Moses has some of these masks that some of you are wearing. There are these copper masks, and he's getting another supply of them. He's selling these for four uh, dollars a piece if there's a bunch of you. He normally sells them for five. He said but if it's a mass, if a bunch of people want to buy one, they're comfortable. They actually look pretty nice. I tried one out for a while because I wanted to see if it was comfortable. And there is some indication that copper might help to mitigate against the, the, the virus. I mean, it, there is, that's a scientific thing. And, um, and they're pretty well tightly woven, so it probably is pretty good. They're comfortable on your ears. Some of those little straps, they hurt after a while. Some of these are pretty comfortable. And he will have them available if you want to buy one. He has them in mostly in black. He has a few other colors right now, but he is going to be having them another order he's getting in in black. That is what, pretty much what he's going to keep after this, I think. But uh, if you want to get one, talk to Moses. Uh, he'll sell you one for $4, and they're comfortable. And they're a little, they, they still... Are a little hard to, you know, they're still, they still blow up on your fog, your glasses, and that sort of thing. But um, better than, than not. But if you don't like it, I learned a long time ago, if students don't like something, if they think it's ugly, if, they, if, it, doesn't, if it isn't cool, I have a hard time getting them to, to wear it. If I get safety glasses that are funky looking, every 10 seconds they're pulling them off. If they look cool, they're like, you know, sunglasses, and they're, they're like, they'll put them on all day. <laughs> So if you get a mask, if you want to wear a mask, get one that you like. Then you won't feel bad wearing it. If, it, you, if you think it looks ugly on you and it's uncomfortable, you'll have a hard time. Get one that you like. Find one that you like. Uh, have you seen that one? <laughs> it actually has that little plastic shield. This is for deaf people. <laughs> so they can read lips. Oh, that was pretty smart. I, I kind of wish we all had that. That way we could all see each other's smiles. <laughs> I miss those behind those masks. But here's one I thought, you know, I looked at that and I thought, you know, I don't know if I'd wear it, but um, at least it has some appeal and it has 
something over my mouth. What is over my mouth if I were wearing that? The cross. Everything I say, everything I do should be stamped with the cross of Calvary. <laughs> and maybe it would be appealing to somebody like that and would wear it. They'd probably wear it with pride if that was them. In other words, get something you like that is comfortable so that you have to wear it. <laughs> And if you don't, you know, so back to it, how can we tactfully encourage one another to remind one another over the nose, uh, not under the chin, <laughs> actually put one on? <laughs> Any ideas? How can we tactfully do that? What can we say? That's not offensive. A lot of people probably just forget. You start talking and it works down off your nose. <laughs> it does. You ever notice that? You start talking and then pretty soon it's down here. Yeah, you just make the motion. You can't see the smile. I try to do it with a smile, but let's, let's try to encourage one another and remind one another so that we can make an environment where we are more of our brother's keeper. We are conscious of our influence on others and that we don't want to pass this on to others if we can limit it. And there is a huge amount of evidence, as I understand it, that shows that wearing a mask can help us to be our brother's keeper. I am my brother's keeper. And one day God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit and it is going to happen soon if this is the end of the world. We want to be a part of that? Let us be our brother's keeper together this year. Let's pray. Father in heaven, please help us to recognize that we are living in a different world and that our actions, our attitudes, what we do, it goes beyond coronavirus. It's helping one another up when they're down, encouraging them spiritually. It's lifting them up academically, socially, not making fun, not bullying. All of these things are preventing the outpouring of your Holy Spirit at the last time and even here on this campus. Lord, help us this year to press together that we might find that indeed we received that a louder rain is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for watching our assembly here at Watch to the Hills. We hope you received precious information. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Also, hit that notification bell so you know when we upload our next program. Follow us on Facebook and on Instagram. The links are in the description box below. Have a great day, and until then, be well.